the fourth book, entitled Melpomene. After the taking of Babylon, an expedition was led by Darius into Scythia. Asia abounding in men and vast sums flowing into the treasury, the desire seized him to exact vengeance from the Scythes, who had once in days gone by invaded Media, defeated those who met them in the field, and so begun the quarrel. During the space of eight and twenty years, as I have before mentioned, the Scythes continued lords of the whole of Upper Asia. They entered Asia in pursuit of the Cimmerians and overthrew the empire of the Medes, who till they came possessed the sovereignty. On their return to their homes after the long absence of twenty-eight years, a task awaited them little less troublesome than their struggle with the Medes. They found an army of no small size prepared to oppose their entrance. For the Scythian women, when they saw that time went on and their husbands didn't come back, had intermarried with their slaves. Now the Scythians blind all their slaves to use them in preparing their milk. The plan they follow is to thrust tubes made of bone, not unlike our musical pipes, up the vulva of the mare, and then to blow into the tubes with their mouths, some milking while the others blow. They say they do this because when the veins of the animal are full of air, the udder is forced down. The milk thus obtained is poured into deep wooden casks about which the blind slaves are placed, and then the milk is stirred round. That which rises to the top is drawn off and considered the best part. The under portion is of less account. Such is the reason why the Scythians blind all those whom they take in war. It arises from their not being tillers of the ground, but a pastoral race. When, therefore, the children sprung from these slaves, and the Scythian women grew to manhood and understood the circumstances of their birth, they resolved to oppose the army which was returning from Media. And first of all, they cut off a tract of country from the rest of Scythia by digging a broad dike from the Tauric mountains to the vast lake of the Myotis. Afterwards, when the Scythians tried to force an entrance, they marched out and engaged them. Many battles were fought, and the Scythians gained no advantage, until at last one of them thus addressed the remainder. What are we doing, Scythians? We are fighting our slaves, diminishing our own number when we fall, and the number of those that belong to us when they fall by our hands. Take my advice, lay spear and bow aside, and let each man fetch his horsewhip and go boldly up to them. So long as they see us with arms in our hands, they imagine themselves our equals in birth and bravery. But let them behold us with no other weapon but the whip, and they will feel that they are our slaves and flee before us. The Scythians followed this counsel, and the slaves were so astounded that they forgot to fight and immediately ran away. Such was the mode in which the Scythians, after being for a time the lords of Asia and being forced to quit it by the Medes, returned and settled in their own country. This inroad of theirs it was that Darius was anxious to avenge, and such was the purpose for which he was now collecting an army to invade them. According to the account which the Scythians themselves give, they are the youngest of all nations. Their tradition is as follows. A certain Targeteus was the first man who ever lived in their country, which before his time was a desert without inhabitants. He was a child, I don't believe the tale, but it's told nevertheless, of Jove, and a daughter of the Borysthenes. Targeteus, thus descended, begat three sons, Laepoxeus, Arpoxeus, and Colaxeus, who was the youngest born of the three. While they still ruled the land, there fell from the sky four implements, all of gold, a plough, a yoke, a battle-axe, and a drinking cup. The eldest of the brothers perceived them first and approached to pick them up, when lo, as he came near, the gold took fire and blazed. He therefore went his way, and the second coming forward made the attempt. But the same thing happened again. The gold rejected both the eldest and the second brother. Last of all, the youngest brother approached, and immediately the flames were extinguished. 
So he picked up the gold and carried it to his home. Then the two elder agreed together and made the whole kingdom over to the youngest born. From Lei Poxaeus sprang the Scythians of the race called Alcatai. From Arpoxaeus, the middle brother, those known as the Catiari and Traspians. From Colexaeus, the youngest, the royal Scythians or Paraletai. Altogether they are named Scoloti after one of their kings. The Greeks, however, call them Scythians. Such is the account which the Scythians give of their origin. They add that from the time of Targeteus, their first king, to the invasion of their country by Darius, is a period of one thousand years, neither less nor more. The royal Scythians guard the sacred gold with the most especial care, and year by year offer great sacrifices in its honor. At this feast, if the man who has the custody of the gold should fall asleep in the open air, he's sure, the Scythians say, not to outlive the year. His pay, therefore, is as much land as he can ride round on horseback in a day. As the extent of Scythia is very great, Colexaeus gave each of his three sons a separate kingdom, one of which was of ampler size than the other two. In this, the gold was preserved. Above, to the northward of the fullest dwellers in Scythia, the country is said to be concealed from sight and made impassable by reason of the feathers which are shed abroad abundantly. The earth and air are alike full of them, and this it is which prevents the eye from obtaining any view of the region. Such is the account which the Scythians give of themselves and of the country which lies above them. The Greeks who dwell about the Pontus tell a different story. According to them, Heracles, when he was carrying off the cows of Gerion, arrived in the region which is now inhabited by the Scythes, but which was then a desert. Gerion lived outside the Pontus in an island called by the Greeks Erythia, near Gades, which is beyond the pillars of Hercules, upon the ocean. Now some say that the ocean begins in the east and runs the whole way round the world, but they give no proof that this is really so. Heracles came from thence into the region now called Scythia, and being overtaken by storm and frost, drew his lion's skin about him and fell fast asleep. While he slept, his mares, which he had loosed from his chariot to graze, by some wonderful chance, disappeared. On waking he went in quest of them, and after wandering over the whole country came at last to the district called the Woodland, where he found in a cave a strange being between a maiden and a serpent, whose form from the waist upwards was like that of a woman, while all below was like a snake. He looked at her wonderingly, but nevertheless inquired whether she had chanced to see his strayed mares anywhere. She answered him, yes, and they were now in her keeping, but never would she consent to give them back unless he took her for his mistress. So Heracles, to get his mares back, agreed, but afterwards she put him off and delayed restoring the mares, since she wished to keep him with her as long as possible. He, on the other hand, was only anxious to secure them and to get away. At last, when she gave them up, she said to him, When thy mares strayed hither, it was I who saved them for thee. Now thou hast paid their salvage, for lo, I bear in my womb three sons of thine. Tell me, therefore, when thy sons grow up, what must I do with them? Wouldst thou wish that I should settle them here in this land, whereof I am mistress, or shall I send them to thee? Thus questioned, they say, Heracles answered, When the lads have grown to manhood, do thus, and assuredly thou wilt not err. Watch them, and when thou seest one of them bend this bow as I now bend it, and gird himself with this girdle, and thus, choose him to remain in the land. Those who fail in the trial, send away. Thus wilt thou at once please thyself, and obey me. Hereupon he strung one of his bows, up to that time he had carried two, and showed her how to fasten the belt. Then he gave both bow and belt into her hands. 
Now the belt had a golden goblet attached to its clasp. So after he had given them to her, he went his way, and to the woman, when her children grew to manhood, first gave them severally their names. One she called Agathyrsus, one Gelonus, and the other, who was the youngest, Sides. Then she remembered the instructions she had received from Heracles, and in obedience to his orders she put her sons to the test. Two of them, Agathyrsus and Gelonus, proved unequal to the task enjoined. Their mother sent them out of the land. Sithes, the youngest, succeeded, and so he was allowed to remain. From Sithes, the son of Heracles, were descended the after kings of Scythia, and from the circumstance of the goblet which hung from the belt, the Scythians to this day wear goblets at their girdles. This was the only thing which the mother of Scythes did for him. Such is the tale told by the Greeks who dwell around the Pontus. There is also another different story now to be related, in which I am more inclined to put faith than in any other. It is that the wandering Scythians once dwelt in Asia, and there warred with the Mesagetai, but with ill success. They therefore quitted their homes, crossed the Araxes, and entered the land of Cimmeria. For the land which is now inhabited by the Scythians was formerly the country of the Cimmerians. On their coming, the natives, who heard how numerous the invading army was, held a council. At this meeting, opinion was divided, and both parties stiffly maintained their own view. But the council of the royal tribe was the braver, for the others urged that the best thing to be done was to leave the country and avoid a contest with so vast a host. But the royal tribe advised remaining and fighting for the soil to the last. As neither party chose to give way, the one determined to retire without a blow and yield their lands to the invaders, but the other, remembering the good things which they had enjoyed in their homes and picturing to themselves the evils which they had to expect if they gave them up, resolved not to flee, but rather to die and at least be buried in their fatherland. Having thus decided, they drew apart in two bodies, the one as numerous as the other, and fought together. All of the royal tribe were slain, and the people buried them near the river Tyrus, where their grave is still to be seen. Then the rest of the Cimmerians departed, and the Scythians, on their coming, took possession of a deserted land. Scythia still retains traces of the Cimmerians. There are Cimmerian castles and a Cimmerian ferry, also a tract called Cimmeria, and a Cimmerian Bosphorus. It appears likewise that the Sumerians, when they fled into Asia to escape the Scythes, made a settlement in the peninsula where the Greek city of Sinope was afterwards built. The Scythes, its plain, pursued them, and missing their road, poured into Media, for the Sumerians kept the line which led along the seashore, but the Scythes, in their pursuit, held the Caucasus upon their right, thus proceeding inland and falling upon Media. This account is one which is common both to Greeks and barbarians. Aristeus, also son of Caistrobius, a native of Proconesus, says in the course of his poem that wrapped in Dionysiac fury he went as far as the Isidones. Above them dwelt the Arimaspi, men with one eye. Still further the gold-guarding griffins, and beyond these the Hyperboreans, who extended to the sea. Except the Hyperboreans, all these nations, beginning with the Arimaspi, were continually encroaching upon their neighbours. Hence it came to pass that the Arimaspi drove the Isidonians from their country, while the Isidonians dispossessed the Scythes, and the Scythes, pressing upon the Cimmerians who dwelt on the shores of the southern sea, forced them to leave their land. Thus even Aristeus doesn't agree in his account of this region with the Scythians. The birthplace of Aristeus, the poet who sung of these things, I've already mentioned. I'll now relate a tale which I heard concerning him both at Proconesus and at Sisychus. Aristeus, they said, who belonged to one of the noblest families in the island, had entered one day into a fuller's shop when he suddenly dropped down dead. 
Hereupon the fuller shut up his shop and went to tell Aristeus his kindred what had happened. The report of the death had just spread through the town when a certain Sisychenian, lately arrived from Attica, contradicted the rumour, affirming that he had met Aristeus on his road to Sisychus and had spoken with him. This man therefore strenuously denied the rumour. The relations, however, proceeded to the fuller's shop with all things necessary for the funeral, intending to carry the body away. But on the shop being opened, no Aristeus was found, either dead or alive. Seven years afterwards he reappeared, they told me, in Proconesus, and wrote the poem, called by the Greeks the Arimaspea, after which he disappeared a second time. This is the tale current in the two cities above mentioned. What follows I know to have happened to the Metapontines of Italy, 340 years after the second disappearance of Aristeus, as I collect by comparing the accounts given me at Proconesus and Metapontum. Aristeus then, as the Metapontines affirm, appeared to them in their own country and ordered them to set up an altar in honour of Apollo and to place near it a statue to be called that of Aristeus the Proconesian. Apollo, he told them, had come to their country once, though he had visited no other Italians, and he had been with Apollo at the time, not however in his present form, but in the shape of a crow. Having said so much, he vanished. Then the Metapontines, as they relate, sent to Delphi and inquired of the god in what light they were to regard the appearance of this ghost of a man. The Pythoness, in reply, bade them attend to what the spectre said, for so it would go best with them. Thus advised, they did as they had been directed, and there is now a statue bearing the name of Aristeus, close by the image of Apollo in the marketplace of Metapontum, with bay trees standing around it. But enough has been said concerning Aristeus. With regard to the regions which lie above the country whereof this portion of my history treats, there is no one who possesses any exact knowledge, not a single person can I find who professes to be acquainted with them by actual observation. Even Aristeus, the traveller of whom I lately spoke, doesn't claim, and he's writing poetry, to have reached any farther than the Isidonians. What he relates concerning the regions beyond is, he confesses, mere hearsay, being the account which the Isidonians gave him of those countries. However, I shall proceed to mention all that I have learned of these parts by the most exact inquiries which I have been able to make concerning them. Above the mart of the Boristhenites, which is situated in the very centre of the whole sea coast of Scythia, the first people who inhabit the land are the Calypidae, a graeco civic race. Next to them, as you go inland, dwell the people called the Alazonians. These two nations, in other respects, resemble the Scythians in their usages, but sow and eat corn, also onions, garlic, lentils, and millet. Beyond the Alazonians reside Scythian cultivators who grow corn, not for their own use, but for sale. Still higher up are the Nuri. Northwards of the Nuri, the continent, as far as it's known to us, is uninhabited. These are the nations along the course of the river Hippanis, west of the Borysthenes. Across the Borysthenes, the first country after you leave the coast is Hylia, the woodland. Above this dwell the Scythian husbandmen, whom the Greeks living near the Hippanis call Borysthenites, while they call themselves Albiopolites. These husbandmen extend eastward a distance of three days' journey to a river bearing the name of Panticapis, while northward the country is theirs for eleven days' sail up the course of the Borysthenes. Further inland there is a vast tract which is uninhabited. Above this desolate region dwell the cannibals, who are a people apart, much unlike the Scythians. Above them the country becomes an utter desert, not a single tribe, so far as we know, inhabits it. Crossing the Panticapes and proceeding eastward of the husbandmen, we come upon the wandering Scythians, who neither plough nor sow. 
Their country and the whole of this region, except Hilaya, is quite bare of trees. They extend towards the east a distance of fourteen days' journey, occupying a tract which reaches to the river Gerus. On the opposite side of the Gerus is the royal district, as it's called. Here dwells the largest and bravest of the Scythian tribes, which looks upon all the other tribes in the light of slaves. Its country reaches on the south to Torica, on the east to the trench dug by the sons of the blind slaves, the mart upon the palace Myotis, called Kremni, the cliffs, and in part to the river Tanais. North of the country of the royal Scythians are the Melanchlini, black robes, a people of quite a different race from the Scythians. Beyond them lie marshes and a region without inhabitants, so far as our knowledge reaches. When one crosses the Tanais, one is no longer in Scythia. The first region on crossing is that of the Sauromatai, who, beginning at the upper end of the Palace Myotis, stretch northward a distance of fifteen days' journey, inhabiting a country which is entirely bare of trees, whether wild or cultivated. Above them, possessing the second region, dwell the Budini, whose territory is thickly wooded with trees of every kind. Beyond the Budini, as one goes northward, first there's a desert, seven days' journey across, after which, if one inclines somewhat to the east, the Thysakatai are reached, a numerous nation quite distinct from any other, and living by the chase. Adjoining them, and within the limits of the same region, are the people who bear the name of Irkai. They also support themselves by hunting, which they practice in the following manner. The hunter climbs a tree, the whole country abounding in wood, and there sets himself in ambush. He has a dog at hand, and a horse trained to lie down upon its belly, and thus make itself low. The hunter keeps watch, and when he sees his game, lets fly an arrow. Then, mounting his horse, he gives the beast chase, his dog following hard all the while. Beyond these people, a little to the east, dwells a distinct tribe of Scythes, who revolted once from the royal Scythians and migrated into these parts. As far as their country, the tract of land whereof I've been speaking is all a smooth plain, and the soil deep. Beyond, you enter on a region which is rugged and stony. Passing over a great extent of this rough country, you come to a people dwelling at the foot of lofty mountains, who are said to be all, both men and women, mauled from their birth, to have flat noses and very long chins. These people speak a language of their own, but the dress which they wear is the same as the Scythians. They live on the fruit of a certain tree, the name of which is Ponticum. In size it's about equal to our fig tree, and it bears a fruit like a bean, with a stone inside. When the fruit is ripe, they strain it through cloths. The juice which runs off is black and thick, and is called by the natives ashki. They lap this up with their tongues, and also mix it with milk for a drink, while they make the leaves, which are solid, into cakes, and eat them instead of meat. For they have but few sheep in their country, in which there's no good pasturage. Each of them dwells under a tree, and they cover the tree in winter with a cloth of thick white felt, but take off the covering in the summer time. No one harms these people, for they're looked upon as sacred. They don't even possess any warlike weapons. When their neighbors fall out, they make up the quarrel, and when one flies to them for refuge, he's safe from all hurt. They're called the Archipians. Up to this point, the territory of which we're speaking is completely explored, and all the nations between the coast and the bald-headed men are well known to us. For some of the Scythians are accustomed to penetrate as far, of whom inquiry may easily be made, and Greeks also go there from the mart on the Borysthenes and from the other marts along the Euxine. The Scythians who make this journey communicate with the inhabitants by means of seven interpreters and seven languages. Thus far, therefore, the land is known, but beyond the bald-headed men lies a region of which no one can give any exact account. Lofty and precipitous mountains, which are never crossed, bar further progress. The bald men say, but it doesn't seem to me to be credible, that the people who live in these mountains have feet like goats. 
and that after passing them you find another race of men who sleep during one half of the year. This latter statement appears to me quite unworthy of credit. The region east of the bald-headed men is well known to be inhabited by the Isidonians, but the tract that lies to the north of these two nations is entirely unknown, except by the accounts which they give of it. The Isidonians are said to have the following customs. When a man's father dies, all the near relatives bring sheep to the house, which are sacrificed and their flesh cut in pieces, while at the same time the dead body undergoes the like treatment. The two sorts of flesh are afterwards mixed together, and the whole is served up at a banquet. The head of the dead man is treated differently. It's stripped bare, cleansed, and set in gold. It then becomes an ornament on which they pride themselves, and is brought out year by year at the great festival which sons keep in honour of their father's death, just as the Greeks keep their Ganesia. In other respects, the Isidonians are reputed to be observers of justice, and it's to be remarked that their women have equal authority with the men. Thus our knowledge extends as far as this nation. The regions beyond are known only from the accounts of the Isidonians, by whom the stories are told of the one-eyed race of men and the gold-guarding griffins. These stories are received by the Scythians from the Isidonians and by them passed on to us Greeks, whence it arises that we give the one-eyed race the Scythian name of Arimaspi, Arima being the Scythic word for one and spew for the eye. The whole district whereof we have here discoursed has winters of exceeding rigour. During eight months the frost is so intense that water poured upon the ground doesn't form mud, but if a fire be lighted on it, mud is produced. The sea freezes, and the Cimmerian Bosphorus is frozen over. At that season, the Scythians who dwell inside the trench make warlike expeditions upon the ice, and even drive their wagons across to the country of the Scindians. Such is the intensity of the cold during eight months out of the twelve, and even in the remaining four the climate is still cool. The character of the winter likewise is unlike that of the same season in any other country, for at that time when the rains ought to fall in Scythia, there's scarcely any rain worth mentioning, while in summer it never gives over raining. And thunder, which elsewhere is frequent then, in Scythia is unknown in that part of the year, coming only in summer, when it's very heavy. Thunder in the winter time is there accounted a prodigy, as also are earthquakes, whether they happen in winter or summer. Horses bear the winter well, cold as it is, but mules and asses are quite unable to bear it, whereas in other countries mules and asses are found to endure the cold, while horses, if they stand still, are frostbitten. To me it seems that the cold may likewise be the cause which prevents the oxen in Scythia from having horns. There's a line in Homer's in the Odyssey, which gives a support to my opinion. Libya, too, where horns bud quick on the foreheads of lambkins. He means to say, what is quite true, that in warm countries the horns come early. So, too, in countries where the cold is severe, animals either have no horns or grow them with difficulty, the cold being the cause in this instance. Here I must express my wonder, additions being what my work always from the first affected, that in Elis, where the cold isn't remarkable and there's nothing else to account for it, mules are never produced. The Eleans say it's in consequence of a curse, and their habit is, when the breeding time comes, to take their mares into one of the adjoining countries, and there keep them till they're in foal, when they bring them back again into Elis. With respect to the feathers which are said by the Scythians to fill the air and to prevent persons from penetrating into the remoter parts of the continent or even having any view of those regions, my opinion is that in the countries above Scythia it always snows, less of course in the summer than in the winter time. Now snow when it falls looks like feathers, as everyone is aware who's seen it come down close to him. These northern regions, therefore, are uninhabitable by reason of the severity of the winter, and the Scythians, with their neighbours, call the snowflakes feathers, because I think of the likeness which they bear them. 
I have now related what said of the most distant parts of this continent whereof any account is given. Of the Hyperboreans, nothing is said either by the Scythians or by any of the other dwellers in these regions, unless it be the Isidonians.